you've experienced this in your life, you've been through an experience that was not pleasant at the time, but it turned out to be formative because through that experience, you learned a lesson that changed your life. Does that sound familiar? Can you relate to that at all? And if something like that has ever happened to you, have you used what you've learned to offer encouragement or, or some help to others? And if so, then you can relate in some way to what Paul experienced in our text this evening. So please find 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. I'm, I'm looking forward to resuming our study in 2 Corinthians, and I don't want to spend too much time reviewing what we've already covered, but I think some review is needed because there are some folks in here who were part of Adventure Club, and so you haven't sat under any of these lessons at all, and so you're, you're jumping into the deep end of the pool. Others, it's been a little while since we've been together, so sometimes you might forget what we have covered. It may not be as sharp or as clear as what it needs to be. Um, but you may remember that 2 Corinthians is a very personal letter, almost an autobiography written by Paul to a church that gave him a fair amount of trouble. And Paul's goal after writing two difficult letters to the Corinthians was to work to restore the relationship that he had at one time enjoyed with them. You see, Paul not only uh, was trying to address some sins that existed in the church, we find out later he was also fighting against the influence of what were known as quote-unquote super apostles who were leading people away from Paul and what he was teaching. However, Paul's relationship with the believers at Corinth was being restored as they responded positively to Paul's harsh or severe letter. Now, we don't have that letter. We don't have a copy of that letter. We know at least three letters were written to the Corinthians. Some say four, but we do know that there were at least three. First Corinthians, then what was known as a harsh letter or a severe letter. It was a letter that was evidently very strong in its rebuke and tone against the Corinthians because they didn't listen to what Paul wrote the first time that he wrote to them. And then the, the letter that we have in front of us, 2 Corinthians, which is actually the third letter, but only two of those letters survived. And so one of Paul's co-laborers, a man by the name of Titus, brought back a good report after they read the harsh or the severe letter, and Paul's concern turned to joy. He addressed that in chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, when he said, "'For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. So the letter accomplished what Paul's aim was, that they would be rebuked by it, that they would repent and turn away from where they were going and the things that they were doing, and that that relationship with Paul would then be restored because the sin issues were dealt with or taken care of. And so as you read the first several chapters of this letter, 2 Corinthians, you can almost feel a sense of relief from Paul, that the sin that was separating them had been dealt with. However, as you progress through the letter, Paul's attitude changes a bit when you get to the last few chapters, but for now, we're walking our way through the opening section or what is known as the prologue of this letter. And so far, Paul has taught us a lot about suffering. In fact, Verses 3 through 7 deal extensively with suffering as a believer for specifically the sake of the gospel. And one of the lessons learned in that section is that we often suffer so that we can be comforted by God, so that then we can comfort others who suffer as we've suffered. In other words, I've suffered, I was comforted by God in that suffering, so now I have a responsibility to go to others who are suffering and be an instrument in God's hand whereby he might comfort them through me. And you have the same responsibility, Christian brother and sister, not just to take your suffering and internalize it and get through it, but then to use what you learned through that suffering to help others who are suffering as well. And the greatest truth that we learned is the fact that the believer is never alone in his or her suffering. Paul described God as the father of mercies and the God of all comfort in verse number three. He breaks all out into this, this doxology, this praise in verse number three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And so 
part of God's nature we talked about is to be unendingly compassionate to his children, that God truly delights in encouraging his people in their suffering. And when we studied that, that verse, I mentioned to you that it's easy to feel as if you have been abandoned by God when you're going through difficult times. It's easy to feel as if you are going through suffering alone. But the reality is this, based on the scripture itself, God never abandons you. You may feel abandoned and you may feel alone and there might not be another soul on earth that's coming alongside of you while you're suffering. But the reality for the believer is that you are never truly alone. God does not forsake his children. That's good news, right? We know that our cries do not fall on deaf ears. Our cries do not ascend to a God who is cold and apathetic to us. We are always then bolstered by God's compassion because we are, in fact, his children. But not only does God show unending mercy to his people, but he also, according to Paul, comforts us in all our afflictions. Don't just go past that word all. It's an important word there, right? Not some, not most, not many, not the majority of, but all of our afflictions, that God comforts us in all of our afflictions, specifically the afflictions that come upon us for the sake of the gospel and because of the gospel. Never forget that God is the source and creator of comfort, not just some comfort, but of every comfort that is to be found in this world. And it's through suffering when we need it the most that we experience God's sustaining comfort. And so Paul opened this letter, as I said, with a word of praise for God and for his character. And we must never forget this. And so look with me then in verse number seven. Look how Paul concludes the first half of this prologue. He says, our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Now, Kent Hughes, a commentator, wrote, we come to this section of 2 Corinthians with God's comfort ringing in our thoughts because Paul used the word 10 times in this brief preceding paragraph, 10 out of its 107 words in the Greek. This great paragraph is meant to echo in our hearts and to affect in us much comfort. Another author wrote, no matter how great the sufferings a Christian is called upon to endure, they are matched and more than matched by the comfort which God bestows, the comfort which is never outweighed by suffering. Think about that. The comfort that is never outweighed by suffering. So now we can turn our attention to the second half of the introduction of this letter. In verses 8 through 11, Paul now provides a personal illustration from his own life, specifically dealing with suffering and the comfort that he received in that suffering. He also makes some important implications that were born out of that experience that are good for us to know and useful for us as believers today. And ultimately, Paul's experience was formative. Why? Because it helped him think rightly about life as a servant of God. So look with me, if you would, Chapter 1, verse number 8, God's Word says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, that, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. And we live in a world that does not value vulnerability. Now, when I say that, be careful not to confuse being a victim with being vulnerable. Those are two entirely different things. There is no shortage of people 
who are willing to go on social media and talk to their iPhone about how much of a victim they are, how much they've been victimized in this world. Anymore, a victim is somebody who's required to work 38 hours a week, right? I mean, that's, oh, I'm victimized by the man. I can't afford my Starbucks anymore. I'm a victim, I tell you, a victim. Now, we should not discount those who have truly suffered injustices in life. People do terrible things to other people, and there are those who have been genuinely victimized. Our heart, as God's people, ought to go out to those people, and we should do everything that we can do to comfort them and encourage them and to help them. I believe with everything in me, we should pursue justice and hold accountable those who abuse and victimize others. But you know there is an entire victimization movement in our culture today. But there aren't many who want to be genuinely vulnerable. Now, there are a lot of different definitions attached to the word vulnerable, but I think the one that best fits our study tonight carries the idea of, quote, being open and honest about your own feelings, thoughts, and needs. And I would add to that without concern about others thinking less of you. And we will often do anything and everything to keep us from looking vulnerable to others. For example, if a man is trying to lift something that is just a little bit too heavy for him, he will give himself a hernia the size of a grapefruit before he asks another guy to lend a hand, right? Right. You're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. You've all done it. Others may put on a brave face amid personal difficulties because they don't want anyone to know that they're struggling. And so when you ask them how they're doing, they give you the F word. They say, I'm fine. I'm fine. They're not, but they're trying to convince you that they are. Why do we do this? Why do we struggle to be authentic? Why do we struggle to be open? Why do we struggle to be genuine with each other? Why do we struggle with vulnerability? I don't think it's because we always want to deceive people. I don't think there's a malicious intent behind it necessarily all the time. I don't think we go around thinking about how we can lie to others so that we can make ourselves look better. I think that sometimes, maybe even the majority of the time, it's just that we're afraid of presenting ourselves as vulnerable to others because if we are open and transparent with them, we run the the risk of them thinking less of us. We might not appear as strong as we want people to think we are. We might not appear as together as we want everyone to think we are. Our family might not look as pure and wholesome and wonderful as we want everybody to think it is, we might not appear as spiritual as we want people to think we are. And that brings us to Paul. Some of you are thinking, what in the world does any of this have to do with Paul and vulnerability? Hang on. You'll see it in a second, I hope. If not, I've done a bad job. None of us would question, at least I don't think we would, Paul's strength. I don't think any of us would question Paul's emotional strength, his physical strength, or his spiritual strength. When you read about Paul throughout the New Testament, you you read of a man who I think would be fairly characterized as a strong man. Now, we know from a physical perspective, he wasn't really impressive, right? Yet, when you consider everything that he went through, everything that he endured, the beatings that he suffered, the fact that he was stoned and left for dead outside of a city one time, the the fact that that, uh, he had been whipped and all of the different things that had happened to him in his life, I don't think any of us would say, wow, that's a weak man. I've, I've never had someone throw rocks at me to the point that they thought I was dead. I've never been whipped like that. I've been spanked, but I, I was not whipped like that. 
Yet Paul here shows a level of vulnerability that I believe should serve as an example to every single one of us. In the verses that we read, Paul was by no means claiming victim status. He wasn't trying to give a woe is me lecture to the Corinthians so that they would feel pitiful for him and feel sorry for him and and maybe like him a little bit more. That's not at all what's going on in this text. But what he does is he reveals his humanity and he openly, willingly, without coercion, reveals his weakness to a group of people who had a predisposition to be a little judgy, especially of Paul. But the lesson that he shared is powerful, and this is the lesson I want to share with you tonight. Those who serve Christ are afflicted, but not without hope. This is what Paul drives at in this text. He, he was a servant of Christ. He was afflicted severely, but yet he was not without hope. And he wasn't afraid to tell people that he was afflicted, and he certainly wasn't afraid to reveal to them his mental and emotional state as a result of being afflicted. And he wasn't afraid to ask them for help because of the affliction. We see a transparency, a vulnerability here that is profound. And it's Paul's vulnerability with the community that, that makes this lesson so, I think, impactful, so powerful. And so what can we learn from Paul's vulnerability? Well, I, th I think there are three lessons, really, the text teaches us from Paul that I want to go with you and show you tonight. First of all, affliction is real. Affliction is real. Now, we have seen this word affliction when we were working our way through verses 3 through 7. Uh, you see it right there in verse number 4. Uh, God, who comforts us in all our affliction, thalipsis is the Greek word here. It's the idea of a pressure from without that, that constrains and, and presses down upon, causing great difficulty, sorrow, uh, angst. So that we may, he says, be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which with we ourselves are comforted by God. So he uses this word affliction in verse number six. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. So we've seen this word before. Now we get to verse number eight, and he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction. Same word, it's distress, leapsis. Paul uses a, a a logical explanatory conjunction, it's the word translated for in verse number eight, to connect what he wrote in the first part of the opening to the personal illustration that he was about to provide in the second part of this opening. And the entire section, this entire pericope, these three verses, are filled with first person personal pronouns. If you look at it, you'll see we seven times, us six times, our three times. And so Paul is not just now. Uh, having himself in view, I, I said earlier he used the apostolic we earlier. Now he's actually talking about himself and the group of people who are traveling with him, his co-laborers who are traveling with him. And, and so he's saying that he was not alone in this. There were other people who were experiencing this at the same time. But notice what he says. We do not want you, the Corinthians, to be unaware. He did not want the, the Corinthian brothers and sisters to be unaware or ignorant without knowledge of the persecution that Paul faced. Now, why is this important? Well, when we get down into verses 15 and 16, you'll see that Paul talks about a change of itinerary that evidently he got wind that the Corinthians weren't happy with him about. And so he explains that the, the affliction that he faced, and not just he, but his team of co-laborers, the affliction that they faced is what really changed the agenda, changed the itinerary, and they weren't able to get to Corinth as quickly as they wanted to get to Corinth again. The fact that Paul wanted to go to Corinth again, I think, shows just a, a, a magnificent amount of love and loyalty to the people in that church, especially when you consider what a, a pain in the backside they were to him, right? But yet he's trying to explain to them, listen, it wasn't just that I, I would flippantly change my mind for no reason. No, there was a great affliction that came upon us. And I, and I need you to be aware of the affliction. But what's interesting about Paul here is that he didn't just stop with saying, we suffered great affliction. No. He kept going. I think the reason he did this was because where there is no information shared, people 
tend to speculate, assume, guess, sometimes even make up what they believe are facts that aren't even facts at all. They do this to fill in the void caused by the lack of true information. So Paul wanted to be open and transparent with them. He wanted them to understand why his plans changed so that it would insulate him from himself from the attacks of his enemies. But he also wanted them to understand the severity of what it is that they went through and what that affliction did not just to him, but to the people that he was ministering with. So look at it. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers. He's not just here writing to men. Uh, the Greek word is adelphoi, which is the idea of, of brothers and sisters, but it was just common to address the brothers. We don't want you to be aware, ignorant of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Now, we can't say for certain what this affliction was. Many of the, the difficulties, many of the trials, many of the sufferings that Paul uh, endured in life and ministry are written down for us, and so we can go and we can read about those. You know about the list in chapter 11. You know about times in the book of Acts where it, it talks about Paul quite literally running for his life uh, from Ephesus when the, the town uh, turned against him. The Jews came in and the, the silversmiths, and they, they, they were furious with him, and they, they turned the hearts of the people against Paul, and Paul had to escape. And, and so we know that there were instances of great trial and tribulation and trouble. But this one is an unnamed, unreferenced affliction. All we know is that they experienced it in Asia. Some have speculated it was a mental thing. Some speculated that it was a, a physical thing. I tend to believe that it was a physical persecution that was uh, so intense that it deeply affected Paul, and not Paul only, but all of his co-workers. And why do I believe that? Well, let's keep reading. He explains for, again, explanatory, for we were so, listen to this language, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. That is not soft language. That is not language that leaves us wondering how bad it really was. The language that Paul uses here is extremely vivid, and it's extremely vivid for a reason, because Paul didn't want to leave any doubt as to the effect mentally and emotionally that this tribulation, that this affliction brought on his life. He, he says that uh, it is something that they were utterly burdened beyond their strength, beyond their capacity, beyond their ability. Their ability to do what? Hold up underneath it. Beyond their ability to, to stand and bear up under the, the force of the pressure that was bearing down on them. And it was coming from the outside. Why? Because it's a passive verb. It's something that definitely happened. Why? Because it's an indicative. It's a truth statement. Paul is saying this, this is just what happened to us. And, and the idea behind the, the term utterly burdened is uh, the root word is, is the idea of, of bodily weight. It, it's almost as if uh, someone was laying all of their weight on Paul, on the people. It, it, it signifies an oppressive suffering by significant power that was being exercised against them. It's the idea of a tremendous amount of, amount of force that is coming on them. What Paul is saying is we were bearing a burden that was too heavy for us to bear. He's just being honest. He's just being vulnerable. Of all the things that Paul went through, he says this thing right here, whatever it was, was something that was far too much for him to hold up under. It has the idea of utterly and unendurably 
crushed. You can think of it this way. You can think of a, of a large container ship being so loaded down with cargo that it sits so low in the water that the, the ocean continually comes up over the bow of the ship and the ship has no ability to lift itself higher in the water. That weight and force is just pressing down on the ship, pressing it into the water even more deeply. It's the idea of a, of a pack animal, a, a mule that falls in despair under its load. The load is so great on the back of that animal that it, its legs buckle underneath it and it, it falls to the ground and it does not have the ability to pick itself back up again. And so it just lays there under the load. That's what Paul says he experienced. And not just him by himself, but those who were traveling with him. And the next thing is astounding to me. Because again, it's so emotive. Everything that he's He's listing here, it's, it's emotive. He, he's, he's giving a lot of emotion behind it. He says, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength or our ability to bear it that we despaired of life itself. This is the result of the, the burden of the affliction that he was bearing, that he was being crushed by. Do you know what that, that word despaired means, or that phrase, despaired of life itself. Some of you aren't going to believe this because you're going to like, you're thinking, wow, no, there's no way that's true of Paul. It means they fell apart emotionally and lost their composure. They lost their emotional and mental composure. It means that Paul's despair was so deep that he felt as if he was in the bottom of a pit and there was absolutely no way out of it. What Paul is saying here is I was about as low as anybody could go. There was no exit. There's no off-ramp. He's under this massive burden and he lost it. Emotionally, mentally, he lost it. And when he says, we, des we despaired of life itself, he's essentially admitting that he was forced to surrender to the prospect of not surviving whatever it was that he and his co-laborers were going through at the time. And Paul likened it to having received the sentence of death. That essentially, this was it. Paul was convinced that he was finished. He was helplessly awaiting the end of his life. Now, we don't know if this was an official sentence of death. I, I doubt that it was. But to Paul... Listen, that's what it felt like. The reality is feelings are real. Paul is stating that here. I've said this for years, and I didn't make it up. Someone else said it, and I grabbed it from them. I don't know who it was, otherwise I'd give them credit for it. But feelings are fantastic passengers. They're lousy drivers, because when they, they get in the driver's seat and they get control of the wheel, they will drive you into the ditch often. But yet God has made us emotional. And he's given us feelings. And Paul here is saying he was struggling with his feelings. Now, that's re really hard to reconcile, right? Because we don't think of Paul that way. And yet, this is what he's revealing to the Corinthians who had been told that he was so weak 
that he should be ignored and not followed. And what we have in front of us is Paul being extremely vulnerable without regard to what they would think of him. And we'll see why in just a few moments. But the situation that Paul was under had such a profound impact upon his life that he he shared it with these people. Paul put his weakness on display. One author wrote, Paul's vulnerability did not just bother his opponents in Corinth. Even great interpreters in church history have had difficulty with this display of weakness. Chrysostom, he, he completely ignored this. He said, no, that can't be true of Paul. But yet here it is right in front of us. And this affliction was as real and as oppressive as it gets, yet in the middle of it, as Paul is being overcome with all of these emotions, what happened? Paul learned an important lesson, and he taught then an important lesson, and his vulnerability enabled him to share that lesson with the people in Corinth and us tonight. And so that lesson is the second thing that we must learn from the text, and that is, Afflictions must drive you to God. Notice Paul keeps on going. We got through the first half of verse number 9. Look at the last half of verse number 9. It starts with, but... Now this is a contrast. He's, he's setting up, okay, this is the way things were at that time and in that moment, but then something changed. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Someone wrote, severe crises have, the, have a way of putting life and our limited resources into perspective. You know that to be true from your own lives, do you not? When those crises hit, it, it totally reframes everything. And sometimes it's very helpful to, to refocus us to bring things into perspective. And so what Paul is doing here in the last half of verse number 9 and into verse number 10 is that he is sharing with his readers the, the purpose for the severe affliction that he went through and all of the emotional distress that it caused, not just him, but those traveling with him. He says, but that was to make. This is a, in the Greek, a henna clause. And if you've been around on Wednesday nights enough, you know that a henna clause is something that is revealing the purpose of something. So Paul is basically saying, all of that happened so that this would be true. All of that happened so that this would take place, or so that we would see this, or so that we would learn this. And so what is Paul saying the purpose of this affliction and all of the emotional despair that came with it was? But that was to make us rely not on ourselves. Paul is saying, listen, when you're under such a crushing weight, when you're down at the bottom of a hole that is steep and and the sides are slick and there's no way to climb out of, what do you do? You're confronted with the reality that you are not enough. I know in this world today, people hate that saying, right? You're not enough, but you're not. And that's what Paul is saying. There's nothing I could do to deliver myself. There's nothing I could do to get myself out of the affliction that was crushing me, that was was causing great emotional and mental angst, that was causing me to think that my life was coming quickly to an end. There was nothing I could do. And what did that ultimately do? It caused me to turn and look to God. Now again, are, are you not amazed that Paul didn't just immediately look to God? but yet he says he was struggling with this and ultimately it taught him to rely not on ourselves, but on God. The root word for the word translated rely here is is interesting because it, it means to persuade or to gain confidence in. 
So what Paul is saying is that this situation, this affliction, was actually serving the purpose of persuading him or giving him confidence not in himself and his ability, but in God. Paul did something else interesting here. He, he used the, the perfect tense and the active voice. And the perfect tense is simply not necessarily focusing on something that happened in the past, but the, the result that came from that action. And, and it's an ongoing thing. So Paul is actually revealing that the affliction and all of the turmoil that it brought served the purpose of teaching him in that moment, but in that moment it would affect the rest of his life so that he then would learn to rely on God and not himself. That he would believe in or trust in God who raises. Notice, that's a, that's a present tense, active verb. Not who raised, talking about Jesus, but who raises the dead. Well, what is Paul talking about? Well, there's a couple different ways to look at it. Paul is, could be saying, well, uh, that, that God, the one who raised at one point Christ from the dead, has the power to raise the dead even now. Therefore, it is not impossible for him to raise us up out of this situation. That's one way of looking at it. Another person said that he's saying, even if we died, it's not impossible for God to raise us from the dead. But what Paul is actually doing is now expressing full, complete confidence and trust in God, not himself. See, Paul has come to realize that Christ followers live by resurrection power. That One commentator said, while having Easter and the coming of Christ as its prime points of reference impregnates the nitty-gritty realities of day-to-day -day existence with the supernatural power for living today in light of that day. But I think it's amazing. Again, getting back to Paul's weakness, which again, in chapter 12, he addresses for us an additional time. But Paul's weakness is where God brought him to the place of true strength. Strength, brothers and sisters, is, is not seen in rugged self-reliance. Strength is found in humble God-reliance. And Paul says, essentially, through all of this, God brought us to the end of ourselves so that we might fully trust in him. One author said, God allows afflictions to bring us to the end of our own resources so that we stop trusting in ourselves and put our trust in the God who can raise us from the dead. This is the comfort Paul found in his affliction. Not that he was strong enough to carry himself through, but that God could carry him through, even raising him from the dead if necessary. Now, I don't know about you, but it is hard for me to imagine that Paul needed to be reminded of this. And yet here he re reveals his struggle in a moment of vulnerability to trust God. And as I was studying this, I thought to myself, well, if Paul needed afflictions to bring him to rely on God's strength and not his own, how much more do I need to learn that lesson? How much more do you need to learn that lesson? And yet, Paul and his co-laborers, they were delivered by God, which increased their confidence in God for the future. Notice in verse number 10, the word deliver is used three times. Clearly, it's the focus of verse number 10. He delivered, that's a, an aorist, but it's also passive, meaning that they were delivered not by anything that they had done, but by the hand of God, that they trusted God, and God delivered them. 
from such a deadly peril. Again, Paul is using words, language, to make us believe that he, he truly believed that his life was in jeopardy. So he says, in the past, God delivered us. And then he says, he will deliver us. That's a future tense. So Paul is saying, today, tomorrow, we have full confidence that he will deliver us. If he delivered us in the past, we have confidence that he can deliver us in the future. Today, tomorrow, the next day, whatever it might be. But then he says, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Now, why would he say he will deliver us and then he will deliver us again? I think what he's doing here is I think he is looking at the past, aorist tense, punctiliar at that point of time. He's looking at the, at the, the near future in our lives and our ministry right now. God will deliver us. But then I think he's looking ahead eschatologically to the final and full deliverance. And that is where his hope was ultimately rooted. That, that no matter what happens to him in this life, his confidence and hope and expectation is in God's power to deliver him fully and finally to himself. And you know what? It's hard if that is where your hope is, and that is what you understand to be true, that God will ultimately deliver me. It is then hard to be plunged into the kind of despair that Paul talked about that he had gone through and that sometimes we get ourselves into. I think sometimes we forget or we neglect to actively hold on to the, the ultimate hope that we have in Christ. And that's not necessarily, not, not necessarily delivered from a situation or circumstance in this world, in this life, but ultimately delivered to himself forever. And Paul reveals in, in a really a beautiful way that, that God is the only one on whom we can safely set our hope. And so for Paul, the, the whole of Christian living, after all, is, is nothing but the hope that God will, in fact, deliver us and all creation one day from death. So, affliction is real. That's the first lesson. It serves a purpose, which is to drive us to God. That's the second lesson. That brings us to our final lesson tonight, and that is affliction must cause you to enlist the aid of others. Why was Paul being so vulnerable with these people? Well, we find out in verse number 11. You also must help us by prayer. We continue here in this theme of vulnerability. Paul told the Corinthians that he needed them to pray for him and for those who were ministering with him. There's no arrogance in Paul here. You know what I'm saying? The, the Corinthians were an absolute mess. He had just upbraided them. Uh, they were a continual thorn in his side. Not the thorn in the flesh, but you know what I'm saying. And here he's saying, I need you to pray for me. The idea behind the word, you also must help, the, those two words, that one word in the Greek has the idea of collaboration. It's a partnership. It's a union. It's doing something together. The idea is simple, that they would join with Paul and with God to bring the assistance that was needed by Paul and his team. Hughes wrote, prayer is indeed a mystery but it is stressed over and over again in the New Testament as a vital prerequisite for the release and experience of God's power. 
It is true that it is God who delivers and that God stands in no need of human prayers before he can act on behalf of his afflicted servants. Yet there is the manward as well as the Godward aspect of such deliverance. And the manward side is summed up in the duty of Christians to intercede in prayer for their fellow believers who are enduring affliction. In prayer, human impotence casts itself at the feet of divine omnipotence. Thus, the duty of prayer is not a modification of God's power, but a glorification of it. Listen, Paul had to be vulnerable with these people and transparent and truthful and open about the affliction and about everything that that it brought to him emotionally and mentally so that he could reveal then God's power to deliver him and others from it, but then also that he might say, I still need you to pray for me. I still need your prayers. In verse number 11, Paul is admitting something. He needed others. This spiritual giant needed others. So why is it that we do not list, enlist others to help us in prayer? Are we afraid to be transparent and vulnerable? Are we afraid to say, listen, I'm going through it right now. And I need you to pray with me and for me. Maybe this has been your experience. You've been truthful and transparent. You've been vulnerable. You've asked somebody to pray for you, and they never did. And you're like, what's the use? People say, I'll pray for you, just like the world says, love you, man. They don't really do it. They don't really mean it. They don't really pray. So you know what? Instead of being vulnerable and sharing with others what I'm going through, I'm just going to keep it to myself and deal with it. Maybe it's felt like, you know what, it doesn't work. I've asked people to pray for me. I've asked people to pray with me, and and nothing really changes. None of those reasons, and there could be myriad more, none of those reasons are really valid for not seeking help in prayer. Paul uses another henna clause in verse number 10, and this is a little bit more obvious, right? You see it, you must help us by prayer so that, there's the reason, there's the explanation, many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. What in the world does that mean? Well, the purpose Paul exposes for asking them to collaborate in prayer is so that others will ultimately give thanks to God for his deliverance of Paul in the future. So as the gospel continues to go forward and more Gentiles hear the gospel, that that they would then be thankful to God for the prayers of those whom God used in collaboration with his work to deliver Paul so that he could continue moving forward in the gospel. The idea is that their faces would turn to God. That's the, the language here. Their faces would turn to God. It comes from Psalms. And so one commentator put it this way, the Corinthians shall be radiant with thanksgiving at the Lord's deliverance of his suffering apostle if only they embrace him and enter into petition on his behalf. And so in vulnerability, Paul exposes his affliction and everything that resulted from it. The lesson that he learned we would not rely on ourselves, but on God. The deliverance that he received and the prayers that he needed. And notice that Paul ends this section the same way he began, really with a word of praise to God. Verse 3 is this 
eulogy, this, this word of praise. And then we get to verse 11, and there's, once again, a word of praise. Give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through, through the prayers of many. You see, Paul understood that God is worthy of praise regardless of the situation or circumstance. Do we understand that? Is it your default position to praise God no matter what you're going through? If not, the question that has to be asked and answered is, what is keeping you from the proper orientation of your heart and life to God? Which is a life of praise, a life of thanksgiving, a life of trust. So I, I'd simply want to close by remembering the main lesson of this text. Those who serve Christ are afflicted, but not without hope. And this is the lesson that Paul, through vulnerability, shared with the Corinthians and with us. And I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that Paul, in a moment of vulnerability, shared his heart with them and ultimately then with us. I'm thankful that God, in his wisdom, kept this and passed it to us. Because although I can't relate to Paul in most ways, I certainly can relate to him here. Can't you? And I can see what he learned and how he saw that it was important that others, by being vulnerable, heard all of this. As believers, we need to understand the value of vulnerability, not to gain pity and not to promote self, but to understand and realize God's power and then help others learn from our lives and to connect with them in the cause of Christ. One of the, the most powerful things of radical mentoring, for those men who have been through radical mentoring, one of the most powerful things of radical mentoring is the fact that you have to be transparent with each other. There's a, a weekend that the men in the program go away and they tell their story and they tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's no holds barred and it's, it, 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 it's amazing. But the power in that vulnerability is the fact, okay, you've been down in the hole that I'm in and God brought you out of it and he can bring me out of it too. Then you walk together. It's powerful. It's wonderful. It's good. But it ought not just be men in a, a special program that do that. It ought to be common in the life of believers that we're vulnerable with one another, transparent with one another, so that we connect with one another and then help others. I'll go so far as to say this connection is vital for your spiritual health. It's vital for your spiritual well-being. It's vital for the spiritual well-being of others. It's vital for the strength of the local church. And this is the blessing of being vulnerable. 